Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, uh, how we evaluate what we do. And we, we um, rely on data, and we're a very evidence-based, data-driven team. And we like to know that we're doing a good job based on facts. So as you know a little bit about Sarasota Memorial, it's a pretty amazing system. Um, but we're going to talk about something called the STS database. The Society of Thoracic Surgeons back in 1989, a fellow named Richard Clark, who predates this paper and has passed away, but he was the chief at the NIH when I was there, uh, went on to uh, say that he thought there should be a major database for the whole program. So by 1989, which was uh, five years after I was at the NIH, they established the STS database. And basically what that is, is every operation that's performed at a mem member institution uh, has a very large amount of data that is collected and submitted to the database. It's typically about a 23-page form of, of uh, data items that are filled in. To, to date, there are now 628 million patients. 95% of the heart operations done in the U.S. appear in the database. There are a, a little over 1,100 participating hospitals. There are 3,107 participating surgeons. One of the driving forces is that our board has said that if you want to maintain your board certification, you have to recertify it every, uh, in five-year intervals in different ways. And in order to be able to recertify, uh, you have to be participating in some approved database. And if it's not the STS database, the process of getting that database approved is a very difficult one. So most institutions that have more than one heart surgeon or more than, uh, do more than a few heart operations participate in the database. And of course, there are database uh, hospitals in all 50 states. There are 10 Canadian sites and 21 sites participating in seven other countries. What's kind of impressive is if you look at this map, this tells you how many programs are in each state that are participating. There are two states over 100, California and Texas, as you would expect. The third largest in terms of numbers of participating programs is our state here. 77 heart surgery programs in the state of Florida participate in the STS database. And then there's obviously that population uh, belt here with a lot of programs, although New York surprisingly has only 32. Pennsylvania, Ohio, and Illinois have in the 60s. And of the cases that go in, you can see most of them are coronary bypass grafting, about 50%. There's aortic valve alone, mitral valve alone, mitral valve repair, coronary bypass, et cetera, and then other procedures. The STS now produces databases in, both, in all three areas of adult uh, cardiac surgery, which is what this is, pediatric cardiac surgery, and thoracic uh, surgery. We participate in the uh, adult cardiac and the thoracic surgery databases. And this is just some interesting information that shows how over a period of time, <coughs> excuse me, the number of cases have changed. So patients who had mitral valve coronary bypass uh, has been relatively consistent. The number of mitral valves that have been repaired has gone up. And the number of tricuspid procedures, as we've seen the importance of tricuspid valve repair in survival after mitral and other kinds of procedures, has been increasing. Uh, of note is that mitral valve plus coronary bypass has slightly been on the decrease, and this is because of some papers that have been published over the last few years looking at mitral valve disease and coronary artery bypass grafting. And what they found is that ischemic mitral regurgitation, that is when you have lack of blood flow to the heart and that causes the mitral valve to leak, repair of those valves is not a long-term successful thing. So we've moved away more from repairing the valves in uh, ischemic heart disease, but in isolated uh, mitral valve disease, we do a lot of repairs. And of course, the rise of TAVR has occurred over the last five, uh, five years, but simultaneously aortic valve replacement has gone up. Uh, aortic valve cabbage has stayed about in that same range, and aortic aneurysms slightly on the decrease. 
It's been, it's an interesting thing to see though that this number of, of uh, tavers, 40,000 tavers, did not really result in more than a, a thousand case difference in the surgical aortic valve replacement. So a lot of these patients are probably patients who either were underserved or were simply considered to be too sick or too uh, delicate to operate on. <coughs> About every uh, six months, the Society of Thoracic Surgery releases what's called a database harvest. And in the database harvest, uh, this is uh, about a 250-page document that provides you in minute detail uh, everything about your program and about the, the program's comparison to the national database. And so you, you find page after page after page of charts like this. So this is isolated cabbage procedures uh, for, uh, this is a sample, so this isn't really related to us, but you'll see odds ratios, observed to expected information, risk adjusted information, and then small charts that talk about uh, in-hospital mortality, for example. And in each case, it's comparing a three-year term. This is obviously old data because it's 2010, 11, and 12. And that's, that's your hospital's data compared to a like hospital's data and compared to the STS average. So let's look at a few things. This is our our program's uh, typical, uh, what we call a dashboard we get from Columbia. And this is looking at our, our patient's uh, isolated coronary bypass, our mortality. Uh, not all of these patients can have a calculated predicted mortality, although for isolated cabbage, we can get a predicted mortality. And our predicted mortality <clears throat> Uh, is uh, about 2.7%. So our observed to expect it is 0.445. And I'll show you some comparisons to all the national numbers. Uh, if you look at aortic valve replacement, our predicted mortality is about 3%. Our actual is 1.4. If you look at mitral valve repair, our predicted mortality is about 2%. Our actual is zero. Uh, this is the same for more complicated procedures. Mitral valve coronary bypass in our hands tends to be patients that are fairly sick. This is from the uh, STS outcomes database for common procedures. So if you look at the in-hospital mortality, for example, the national average uh, predicted mortality or the actual national average mortality is 1.7 percent, aortic valve 1.6. Uh, up to mitral valve cabbage, which is actually 8%, and mitral valve repair plus cabbage, uh, 4%. So if we take our data, <coughs> compare it to the national average and to our predicted, <coughs> what we find is for coronary artery bypass grafting, the predicted national average mortality is 1.7%. Our predicted mortality is 2.7%. Uh, essentially a, a half again as high as the national average, but our average mortality is less than the national average. Again, aortic valve replacement, the national average mortality is 1.6%. Our predicted is three, but our, our uh, actual is less than the national average. And for aortic valve plus coronary bypass, the national, predicted uh, national average mortality is almost 3%. Our predicted is 4%. Our actual was zero. This is a page from our thing, just in case uh, what you hear, which is uh, that our population is a few old people, um, it, it is right. Uh, if you look at the patients who are over 65, the national average is about 55, 56 percent. In 2017, 75 percent of our patients were over the age of 65. If you look at the patients in our series with chronic lung disease of any type, the national average is about 20%, the SDS average is 17%. This is actually our peer average. Our average in 2017 was, uh, was over 40%. If you look at uh, cross clamp times and cardiopulmonary bypass times, um, uh, in this I think is uh, coronary bypass data just for an example, you can see our three, uh, our three times uh, for our participant hospital, 
for cross clamp time are all sig significant, almost significantly less than the national averages and our pump times are less than the national averages. It means that we get our operations done uh, in efficient periods of time with less time on the heart-lung machine, which we think is critical. A new measure that we've started to look at is something called failure to rescue, FTR, or fa failure to retrieve. And it's a metric that has to do with when we operate on patients and they have a problem, how do we take care of that? Obviously, we'd like to say that every patient that we operate on goes through and has no complications and does well. And we, we aren't as good at lying as some of the politicians in this country right now. So we'll say that that's uh, not really true for us. Uh, all programs have complications. And when complications happen, there needs to an be an ability to overcome the complications and that the rescue provides a marginal increase in survival. Uh, but the interesting thing is, is are, are our results good because we don't have complications? And that's been a very interesting thing that people have looked at. And it turns out that the metric of failure to retrieve may be more a metric on the system of care than on the operative procedure or on the operating surgeon, uh, his or herself. Success of good programs depends on bringing patients back from the brink. This is, I think, an amazing program because we had a couple of residents speak to us today very eloquently and it, and it did a superb job. Uh, but this poor resident did something that's pretty amazing, which is he reviewed 105,000 cases. Um, I think most of this was computer-generated data from, a, uh, from the Maryland uh, 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 system of records. But basically what he looked at was patients who had emergency bowel resections. That's a fairly dangerous procedure. It's usually a procedure that involves uh, what we, we as surgeons call contamination, uh, high risk for infection, things like that. He then divided the uh, hospitals into quintiles by mortality. So there are five different mortality rates from a very low mortality rate to a very high mortality rate. And then he took each of those quintiles and calculated the complication rate for each of those hospitals. And here is the amazing thing. The best hospital had a 1.5% mortality rate. The worst hospital had a 15% mortality rate. But yet when you looked at the complication rate, the complication rate was 33% for the best hospital and 41% for the worst hospital. Almost the same. But the failure to rescue was only 3.4% for the best hospital, whereas it was 33% for the worst hospital. So clearly it's not the complication rate, it's how these places dealt with the complication rate. Same complication rates. How does that correspond to cardiac surgery? Well, it says the success of the top quintiles had to do with the ability to recognize and deal with complications in a timely fashion. That's a quote from the article. A good team is critical to rescuing patients from the complication. Fred Edwards is the director of the database for the STS. Paul Kurlansky is one of the Columbia faculty that support our program and that I talk to and work with all the time. Uh, Jeff Jacobs is one of the STS database people who works up at, uh, up at Children's Hospital um, in St. Petersburg. And they looked at, for the adult database, uh, coronary artery bypass grafting failure to rescue rates. So they selected from the STS database from 2010 to 2014, 604,000 patients in 1,105 centers. Then they broke that down into 78,000 patients who had one or more complications. And we look at these complications all the time specifically. Stroke, renal failure, reoperation, and prolonged ventilation. And one thing that would seem pretty obvious is if you have uh, only this is the number of patients who had no complications, one complication, two, three, and four complications. 
and the blue bar represents the mortality. So if you have uh, four complications, all four of those complications, <coughs> your mortality rate is between 50 and 60 percent. So the accumulation of, of uh, complications is a bad thing. They then divided all these centers, uh, like, like the first place, the, divided them into five cardiac centers, were divided into, into terciles, into three centers, highest to lowest by overall mortality. So there were, there were 900 patients that they looked at. The lowest uh, mortality rate for any center was 0 to 1.5 percent. The highest was 2.3 to 7.9 percent. The average mortality, 1.1, 1.9, 3.1. The rate of complication, however, this goes from 1 to 2 to 3 roughly as a ratio of mortality. But the complication rate really goes 1, goes 11, 12, 15. The overall average complication rate was 13, but neither the low tercile mortality centers or the high tercile varied greatly. So basically what they're saying is these, this is a complication rate for doing heart surgery. If you buy in to operating on patients with an open heart surgery program, you're going to have a complication rate somewhere around 12 to 13 percent. But how those patients do depends on how your, how your center can take care of that. Failure to rescue for the best center was only 6.8 percent, whereas failure to rescue for the worst center was 13.9 percent. What makes a successful cardiac surgery program? Good centers don't necessarily have the dramatically lower complication rates. Good centers identify complications and enact measures to relieve or mitigate the complications. Good centers know their complication rates and always look to improve. This is another part of our dashboard. We receive this dashboard every month and as we just said, there are four main complications. Stroke, prolonged ventilation, deep sternal wound infection, <coughs> renal failure, and reoperation. We sort of throw out sternal wound infection because, knock on wood, we, don't, we just don't see that at our center. But of the other four, which were the four that were referred to in the article, in every category, we look at whether we're at or below the expected level. And if we're below our expected or predicted level, it comes in green on our dashboard. Uh, when Columbia came and presented this to us for the first time, they had never seen a center generate a completely green dashboard. Of note at the bottom is our atrial fibrillation rate. So we see that that's a significant thing that we deal with every day. We do not consider that a complication. That's part of the business. But if you look at, for example, uh, stroke rate, Stroke rate for coronary bypass, we had a 0.23% rate of uh, uh, stroke rate. Um, zero for valve cases, which is rather remarkable. So what really makes a good quality cardiac surgery program? What makes us able to do this? It's really the people here. It's the team, it's the nursing in the ICU, it's the nursing in the OR, it's the clinic people, it's the operating room staff, it's everyone here that does it. So how do we do all these things? We do it because we have people who know that that's what we do. They look for the problems, they help us to measure them and to avoid them, and they bring us into better results. So the STS takes six different procedures, or rather five different procedures, and rates them in one to three stars. You can receive three stars, which is the highest rating. You have to be above the 95th percentile in the qualifying category uh, to be able to be in the three star rating. So they look at aortic valve replacement alone, coronary bypass grafting alone, the combination of those two procedures. Mitral valve procedures, they lump repair and replacement together mitral valve repair replacement with coronary artery bypass grafting. 
Sarasota Memorial scored three stars in all five categories. How significant is that? Well, if you look at the mitral valve data alone, which is the newest data, of the centers that received three stars in mitral valve repair and three stars in mitral valve repair plus coronary bypass grafting, there were seven out of 1,008. But the most significant thing is if you look at centers that received three stars in all categories, there were three. So believing that we can guess probably the Cleveland Clinic and the Mayo Clinic might be the other two, where would you like to have your heart surgery done? Well, the stars uh, seem pretty much the same, but I think many of you have seen this slide that really tells the difference. <laughs> 